On this episode of the Investment Opportunity Podcast, we talk with Dan Schneider from the Valuation and Information Group about COVID valuations. Welcome to the Investment Opportunity Podcast. We'll educate you on the latest investment trends happening in one of the hottest real estate classes, skilled nursing and seniors housing. We'll point out the risks so you can reap the rewards of investing in this growing and complex industry. And now your hosts, Ben Boland and Brandon Boland. Welcome to the Investment Opportunity Podcast presented by Senwell Senior Investment Advisors. I am Brandon Boland, joined by my co-host, Ben Boland. We are twin brothers, so if you hear the same voice, we apologize ahead of time. But you can always catch us on video. We have this podcast that you can download anywhere where you listen to your podcast. You can also find the podcast at SenwellAdvisors.com. Senwell Advisors is a skilled nursing and seniors housing mergers and acquisitions advisory firm. And today we have with us on the show, Dan Snyder. Dan is the senior vice president of the valuation and information group. And VIG or VIG provides value valuations and appraisal services to healthcare facility operators, lenders, and their advisors. Dan, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. For those of you who can't see Dan, Dan Dan grew out a really nice COVID beard. He's looking fresh. We like Thank it. Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> we like it. Hey Dan, um, for those of you, for those out there that don't know um, anything about the the valuation and information group, can you, I guess, provide an introduction to us about about you and what you're doing over there? Yeah, my name is uh, Dan Schneider. Uh, I've been with valuation and information group since 2006. Um, we've been in business for a total, total of, of about 21 years. We provide valuation and other advisory services um, uh, for senior housing and skilled nursing industry. Um, we also provide um, in, in some publication information uh, we provide a publication for the, uh, the skilled nursing industry where we go state by state providing different uh, regulations for skilled nursing facilities, including uh, reimbursement uh, and Medicaid uh, related information. And, you know, right now with COVID going on, we are researching quite a bit and finding out the different programs in the different states that are providing additional uh, funding during this pandemic. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's, uh, it's, it's changing on a daily basis and to keep up with each state is extremely time consuming, but you're probably getting a lot of phone calls right now. So when, when somebody's calling you right now, what's, what's the, the number one question that you're getting and how are you responding? It's probably the number one question we get all the time. What's value? Um, you know, as soon as, this was declared a pandemic or, you know, closely after the Nick conference and in March, we were getting the phone calls, you know, what's going to happen to valuation? What, where's valuation for senior housing and skilled nursing facilities? And, uh, I, I, you know, for a couple of weeks, I think, you know, not just from the senior housing standpoint, but, you know, real estate in general, I think the appraisers became therapists for a lot of lenders out there trying to, calm the storm uh, of, you know, where's valuation going? Um, you know, in terms of that number one question, you know, where's value? Um, you know, we've been, you know, we try to, in, in terms of, uh, you know, appraisals, we're trying to mimic the market and what the market's doing. Right now, you know, we've been on the phone researching, doing as much as we can. Uh, talking to brokers, investors, operators, as many people as we can to get understanding from them what their fear, feeling is. Um, you know, right now, there's not a whole lot of transactions going on. Uh, there's transactions that were um, developed a year ago or less than a year ago that are closing and, and, and getting done right now. Uh, but a lot of new transactions are, are just being put on hold until the, the dust settles a little bit. So in terms of, you know, cap rates and trying to figure out exactly, you know, what the impact 
to valuation is right now is very difficult. And those, um, sorry to interrupt, but those deals that you are seeing closed, it, it seems like there hasn't been any kind of um, origination of deals over the past few months. Uh, but but those laggers that maybe they initiated the deal prior to COVID and we're starting to see those come through. On those, are you seeing any price adjustments because of COVID or are you seeing anyone, uh, for example, any sellers give any concessions because maybe their occupancy was lower? We've heard of price concessions on, on some deals. And, th- and those deals are deals that um, that had COVID outbreaks. Um, but there's deals that, that haven't had COVID outbreaks. We haven't seen, you know, price concessions. So there are deals getting getting done that that have no price concessions because of COVID, you know the pandemic itself. But those buildings that did have an outbreak, yeah, we are seeing some of those be uh, renegotiated. And so when when you're, I guess when you're evaluating. Uh, deals that are coming to you and you have to sit there and kind of stare at, I would imagine it's almost a, not necessarily a blank piece of paper, but this is new territory for everyone. So what are some new factors that you're looking at when you're going through an appraisal? Um, Whether that be, you know, short-term occupancy issues or any kind of long-term physical plant issues where you might've seen, you know, semi-private could have been okay in some markets and, it may not necessarily be okay in other markets going forward. What are you seeing there? Right, and, and, and how we're dealing with it uh, internally in terms of valuation. Uh, I mean, right now there's no evidence that you know cap rates have changed and uh, valuation um, methodologies have changed for for senior housing or or skilled nursing. Um, you know, again, there has there hasn't been any transactions to really support any kind of evidence of changing cap rates. Um, in terms of the skilled nursing industry, there are, you know, NOI disruptions in terms of increased hazard pay, uh, increased PPE cost, um, and you know other related costs. But the federal government has put a lot of different programs, including the CARES Act and several other programs that try to offset some of those increased expenses and disruption uh, to the skilled nursing facilities. Um, you know, going back to appraisal methodology, I'd like to remind everybody is that, you know, valuation, the definition of value is future economic benefits. Now, while this is a disruption in the business, we do expect this to stabilize it uh, at some point. And the federal government seems to be providing the funding for this to, disruption in business. So even though I I guess what you're saying is we're seeing higher expenses be offset by maybe some one-time stipends funded by the federal government. And so I guess the the other question is, are those stipends enough to supplement the nursing home industry, the skilled nursing industry as a whole, uh, as we get through this? Um, I think it's going to overcompensate for certain facilities um, and it's going to undercompensate for other facilities. I mean, the the facilities in the Northeast, I think were unfairly hit um, in in terms of the pandemic. So we're seeing facilities in the Northeast with significant cases of um, uh, COVID ban of emissions, um, uh, significant uh, mortality rates and, those facilities are definitely going to be more affected, and maybe those, you know, programs, the, gov- the federal and state programs that help offset those losses, aren't going to fully cover those this, you know, that disruption in in, in business. But you know, there's other facilities, and you know, look at states that haven't been as affected, you know, like Maine. Uh, or some uh, Midwest states that haven't been affected as affected uh, as the Northeast, and they're going to some of these programs may even overcompensate some of those facilities as well. Hey Dan, you mentioned you have heard of people giving concessions if there've been COVID positive patients within the facility. Let's just if we were to walk through an example, let's just say there's an owner operator, there was an outbreak in their facility. 
and they were possibly thinking about taking their facility onto onto the market. Do they have anything to be afraid of moving forward in terms of pricing because they had a positive COVID patient or possibly multiple patients moving forward? On the I mean, that's an excellent question. You know, I think most of the brokers would tell that seller, you know, hold on. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, let, let the dust settle a little bit. Don't take a big price decrease today. Let's wait, you know, a few months. And, you know, as states reopen, especially the summer, as we're seeing, you know, um, a, a lot of the stay at home orders being lifted and states getting back to normal business or a, a different kind of business. Um, you know, I, I think as the dust settles here, the, the, the broker is going to tell them to wait a couple months before they take it to market. Yeah. And the, I guess moving forward too, I think, I think the building layout plays a huge factor in terms of the, the marketing aspect and right. as well as, uh, especially in skilled, you have a lot of semi-private rooms compared to a private room. That's obviously more desirable, especially given this market. So do, do the, do the private rooms have, I guess, do they have a higher value today than what they did yesterday? I mean, that's hard to say. And I don't know if there's enough market evidence for that. Um, you know, I, I think from the start of pan, the pandemic in March till now, the, the industry and operators have learned a lot in how to contain it, how to control it, um, and, and how, to, how to reduce it. And even Genesis on their earnings call last week, you know, discussed, you know, they're seeing a flattening in their buildings and, and, and actually the number of positive tested patients and staff members have, are declining. So I think, you know, the industry has learned a lot and that's going to help, you know, stabilize stabilize the industry as well in terms of where we're talking about as far as pricing and, and the burgers kind of probably saying, hold on, that's don't take this big price cut today. Just wait a couple of months and let it settle down a little bit. Yeah. I'm- so in terms of private versus semi-private, I think it's too early to say whether that's going to be a big impact going forward with, you know, on the skill side, it's still, it's still, you know, 70, 80% of most nursing homes are funded by Medicaid, right. the state Medicaid's programs. And until you'll see, until they're, they're willing to um, provide funding for private units, I, I think you're still going to see an overwhelming um, uh, 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 you know, portion of semi-private units in the, in the market. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, obviously every state's going to be different here. So on the revenue side, what are some states that you're hearing about that are doing a really good job with additional reimbursements or grants? And and what are some states that have been behind the ball? Um, I don't know if all the states, because I don't, you know, I, we are working on a, in a bunch of different states right now, and we're kind of taking it as you know, the states that we're working on. Um, but Connecticut, you know, which I, I know in terms of um, lending, it's always been one of those states that everybody's kind of fearful of because, you know, everybody's worried about Connecticut's, uh, you know, we trying to reduce the number of skilled nursing beds all the time. But they, you know, they've increased funding by to on the Medicaid rate by 15% to help offset some of those losses. Um, I know it's been extended to June 30th. I think they're trying to extend that through the summertime, the September 30th. Um, Arkansas put out a program to um, help offset um, uh, this disruption as well. Uh, their funding pro- program is. Uh, more to uh, provide additional payments to the staff. Um, I'm not sure how how it's structured, but it's it's structured to to help pay for increased uh, st- um, hazard pay for the staff. Um, so th- we we are seeing a number of states um, try and assist the skilled nursing facilities, and um, yeah, even Maine. Maine's offering um, additional. Uh, payments, even though they don't have a whole lot of cases up there, um, to both um, 
skilled nursing and to uh, Medicaid waiver assisted living facilities. So we're seeing a lot of states like you just mentioned, but it's, it sounds like a lot of those reimbursements are tied directly to increased expenses. So things like increased labor costs, whether that be through, a, um, I'm sorry, overtime, increased agency costs, um, or any kind of uh, hazard pay or things like that. We're also seeing, uh, you know, increased PPE expenses. Have you seen any state come out and say, um, you know, because to what Ben alluded to before, we are seeing a lot of nursing home operators that need to convert from semi-private to private. And sometimes that includes just dealing with the existing real estate asset that you have. And so um, you'd mentioned that you guys have been putting out a report that specializes in, you know, kind of taking a look at what each state is doing different and maybe looking at those increased um, reimbursements. But is anyone really factoring in the decline in occupancy? So if you have a hundred bed nursing home, that's all semi-private, you now need to figure out a way to, if you are going to keep COVID positive patients in that nursing home, you need to figure out a way to, to manage and care for these, um, these patients and somewhat isolate as best you can. So are you seeing any states really take that into account or is it just more directly related to the expense? Um, well, what, if you are caring for patients with COVID, you can receive Medicare reimbursement for those um, Correct. patients Fed- that tested, tested positive for COVID. Federal. So you get increased funded, funding correct. from that. Um, yeah, we are also seeing that um, you know, facilities take a wing or a unit and convert them to all private units. And if they are admitting residents still, they're putting them into, you know, quarantine for 14 days before they're moved into the general population. So that's affecting occupancies and in facilities as well. Um, you know, short-term surgeries at hospitals are, um, you know, or haven't been going on for the last couple of months, and that's affecting the occupancies in uh, skilled nursing facilities. Um, so that you know, we are seeing you know drops in occupancy. I think you know Genesis um, in, in their earnings reported that you know they're seeing from a decline from 87, 88 um, percent to around 76 percent in their in their portfolio. But again, they're saying that it's flattening, you know, the, the curve is flattening and they're, they're hopeful that, you know, with short-term surgeries and the ban of admissions on, you know, a bunch of their facilities that they're hoping that, you know, during the summer months to start increasing those occupancies once again. Um, but I think to offset some of those losses, you know, the state, you know, offering uh, increased funding, like Connecticut 15%, um, and the Medicaid program, plus the other federal federal programs that are out there um, that are helping is, is offsetting some of those losses on, you know, occupancy and the increased expenses with PPE and, and, and wages. Um, again, it's, it's hard for us to tell whether that's co- going to completely cover everything, but, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, it, you know, I think it's one of those things we'll have to wait and see what happens. Okay. Yeah. So Dan, if I'm hearing you, it, it, it sounds like this is, this is not a, a, a long-term issue. It's, it's more of a short-term, um, I guess it's a short-term maybe. Disru- yeah. Disruption in business. Di- I think it's about probably a, a good way to say it is, it's a disruption in business. It's it's causing you know lo- you know losses in 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 NOI, but you know to offset some of those losses on the skilled side, there's been s- several federal programs and state programs to try to offset some of those some of those losses. And in terms of value, I mean, the best way we can look at value is you know what what is the stabilized NOI, and and you know try to figure out what the sort term disruption of expenses are, you know, and subtract that from this, you know, more of a stabilized NOI, stabilized value. 
Yeah, and, and that's the message as Ben and I go, kind of go through our day-to-day is uh, the message we give to sellers is we echo a lot of what you just said is that we let sellers know to try to hang on if you can. But I guess one, if you had one bottom line point to make um, in holding value, I have my opinion and I'm sure everyone has their own and it's probably the, close to the same thing. But if you were to talk to a seller and say, if you have to sell, this is the thing you should pay most attention to today. Well, I, I think it depends if whether you're a skilled nursing operator or, or uh, assisted living or senior housing operator. Uh, on the skilled side, it's, you know, you're still looking at a skilled need, a, a skilled or a need driven basis. Um, you know, there's still a need, uh, even though, you know, there's been a disruption, your occupancy may be down, you may have some COVID long term, you know, uh, operation, you know, should stabilize back to uh, pre COVID. And, you know, the landscape may change because of COVID and, you know, how the government, uh, government's oversight of skilled nursing facilities, but also some of the reimbursements may have to change too in terms of Medicaid and Medicare and, and funding for these type of uh, facilities. So while there may be increased expenses, they're probably going to be increased funding, you know, to deal with a lot of these um, uh, issues going forward. On the on the senior housing side, it's mainly private pay, so it's a lot different. Mm-hmm. They're not getting the you know the same amount of um, additional funding from the federal government because mainly mainly that's been for Medicare um, facilities that accept Medicare, so they're not getting the same type, and they are dealing with. Um, decreased occupancy levels, and many of them don't qualify for the Payroll Protection Act because uh, they're too large for that. Um, so, you know, with skilled or with assisted living and memory care, it's still a need-driven basis, need need-driven business. So, expect that to stabilize again. Um, you know, especially with pent-up demand, and and you know, there's I think there's a lot of people. Uh, that either took their parent out of a, you know, out of an assisted living facility, uh, or has been caring for that senior, you know, their senior parent at home during this pandemic, and are realizing that they don't have or are not capable of really taking care of that uh, of their parent. And you know, as the states start opening up and the facilities are allowed to take facility or patients again or residents again. I, you know, I think there's some pent pen up demand that will go back to increase some of these uh, occupancies at some of these facilities. It will take some time, um, and, and that's that's the biggest question: How long will it take to stabilize these facilities once we start to reopen? Time will tell. Yeah, uh, yeah. the the situation you just described. My my next door neighbor actually did that same exact thing. He pulled his 96 year old father out of an assisted living facility and he's living with him right now. Um, so I, I just asked him yesterday when he plans on, you know, what the timeline looks like in terms of how, how long he's going to be living with them. He do, he's not sure. Um, I think just exactly what you just said, time will tell. We, we're not sure how this is going to all play out, but, um, Hopefully, it's, it's, it's hard on the senior too, as being, you know, I know from personal experience too, like you have, my wife's grandfather was all set to go into a senior housing project. You know, they had the whole deposit down, and then, um, you know, then the stay at home order was issued. And, you know, why would, while they would still accept him, uh, the family knew that we, they wouldn't be able to visit him and, and help him while I was there. So they just decided to hold them back and not, not put them in. But because of the stay at home order and everything else, he, you know, he sees only a couple of rooms a day and a couple of people a day um, staying with his son. Uh, so it's not, you know, it's not good for the senior either because they're not getting, you know, the, the interaction with other people and, um, you know, he's very limited to where he can go and what he can do. Uh, so once they do open up and there's, you know, he, he can return to a facility and 
and you know it will allow visitors i think that's when you're going to see um you know um, the pent-up demand start returning back to the, the senior housing yeah I, I tend to agree with you it's going to come to a head it's just a matter of when and i think people will will uh, eventually get comfortable with the with the situation again um dan last question are you going to keep the beard I don't know. It's coming in a little grayer than I thought it would. So hopefully we can go to a conference soon and and see it live and in person. (laughs) Hopefully that's the case. It was a goatee, and I shaved it off. And my son, uh, my son told me I I looked a lot better with it. So (laughs) I had to grow it back. Catches all the crumbs too. It does. It does. You know, it it saves some snacks for later. Well, hey Dan, thank you so much for uh, for joining us and sharing your knowledge with with our listeners. We appreciate it. And, uh, what's the best way for people to get a hold of you? Uh, the best way to, to get a hold of me is email. Uh, the, my email is d schneider at valinfo.com. You can also, I am in the office, uh, daily now. So you can call me at the office here at 610-566-3526. Great. And um, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate being a part of this. Thanks, Dan. Take care. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. Welcome to the What You Got segment of the show. Today's offering is located in the Toledo, Ohio market, which is where we are located. This facility is a skilled nursing facility that is owned and operated by a nonprofit. Uh, It's currently losing quite a bit of money, but we do see a path to profitability and we can lay that all out in the om if you are interested Uh, there is roughly about 40 beds or so but has the opportunity to add beds to the current facility given that they all are private rooms with jack and jill bathrooms so if you are interested in this opportunity feel free to contact me at ben at senwelladvisors.com thanks Thank you for listening to the Investment Opportunity Podcast. If you want to hear more about investing in the skilled nursing and seniors housing industry, head to our website at www.senwelladvisors.com slash podcast.